Hello, I'm Dave Mowitz and welcome to Successful Farming. On today's program, we travel to Oklahoma to feature a nifty metal pegboard that would be a welcome addition to any farm or ranch shop. If you're like me, you've come to appreciate those great repair and maintenance reports by the engine man, Ray Bohax. Well, Ray joins us on today's show with another one of his great insights into engine maintenance. Also, I tracked the recent sale of one of the most affordable pieces of equipment in agriculture today, 300 horsepower plus tractors. Today's Steel Deals report focuses on John Deere 8335R tractors. For good measure, we feature the grandfather of the 8335R, a rare high crop John Deere Model H. And after these brief messages, I head to Northern Illinois to tour a hard working farm shop built on a budget, but not lacking in innovations. All that and more coming up on Successful Farming. I traveled to Northern Illinois near the Wisconsin border to tour Kim and Mark Baker's shop. What attracted me to this particular shop was actually the farm operation. Along with sons Chad and Zach, the bakers milk around 150 head of cows. Of course they have row crops. <laughs> they run no less than five forage baggers in a custom farming service. And if that is not enough, they operate Baker Precision, a planter repair and calibration business. So I just had to see what kind of shop it takes to accommodate all those activities. Let's go talk to Mark Baker about the farm structure. Mark, this is a, a farm that uh, never ends with activity because it's diversified not only necessarily in agriculture, but agricultural businesses. That is correct, yes, it is. So we've got a lot going on in this farm and uh, it's a family farm, obviously, and we do precision planning. So when you say precision planting, precision planting, planting gear. Yeah, we're precision planting dealers, Baker Precision Planter Works. Um, and then my boys, uh, they do uh, custom bagging for forages and, and such as that. And on top of that, the dairy farm. So uh, yeah, we try to keep busy, uh, yeah. Diversified farm like that, I'm guessing you really needed the headquarters. Yeah, yeah, and that, that's what we realized in, in the farm that you know, we worked out of a little tiny shop. You could pull in a pickup truck and it was consumed by that. You couldn't move around. You could hardly even change oil in it. And we realized a few years ago that we needed to do something. This is a shop that's used for a livestock operation because shops and livestock farms, they get worked. Oh yeah. Now the, the eave run north and south. That is correct. And your main door to the shop then faces? Well, the main door is facing the south. And then we have a, a side door off to the west. And the reason why, I mean, I, you know, this side of the shop, we probably could have got along with just one door, but when we're in the heart of the season on planters and stuff and working on uh, customers' planters, it, using the other service door is nice to get a, a pickup truck, a skid loader, manure spreader for that matter, or whatever it might be, and you can get in and out. And it, it makes it really nice. So if you're having meetings in here and you got a dairy, yep. you're bringing in <laughs> less than clean equipment to be worked on. Oh, absolutely, yeah. How do you keep it this clean? I, I guess, uh, you know, the thing is, is when we built the shop, it, it, was, it was a huge undertaking for us anyway. I mean, for some people might laugh at that, but you know, I always said, if I'm gonna build a shop, I'm gonna keep it clean. I've been in too many shops that, you know, were just so cluttered and it was hard to get around and the floor gets dirty and then you drop some, you know, another bolt and you can't find it and so on and so forth. So I was adamant that we were going to keep the shop clean and I don't make too many friends on the farm, but about December 1st, we, we scrubbed this thing from head to toe. Really? Oh yeah. Yeah. Head to toe. I mean, floor, scrubbing. floor, ceilings, walls. 
but a lot of guys attach are permanently fixed to the floor. You kept everything detached? Yeah, I, I wanted everything, so if there's ever a plan that changes or we need to add on or move or do something, no tool other than the jib frame is you know, adhered to the floor, if you will. What turned out to be one of the most useful features in the baker shop, this jib crane was made so useful because of its installed location. The door placement was something, you know, again, we just wanted to be able to have accessible ability to get in and out with equipment. And then the jib crane was placed, you know, with the fabricating in mind, you know, right. and being able to swing that and be able to go out the door and bring product in and, you know, and uh, it, that, that really was a deciding factor. So, jib crane in mind, you set it by the main door right off to the side, and I'm looking over here and I'm seeing this must be the metal fabrication area between the two doors. Correct. And it's pretty extensively equipped. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, I, I, I came from, my, my brothers are in the fabrication also, and so we've all, all of us Baker boys, we all learn to fabricate. Fairly typical of farm shops, you have a storage loft up to one end, below it of course is the workbench, makes sense, logically, yeah. that's yeah. a good place to do it, and you have an extensive workbench. Now your office is perched up there in the loft. That is correct. Yeah, and that was pretty, it was a going thing when you built the office. Or built the shop, I mean. Yeah, and we we knew when we built the shop that that, that we needed to build it in phases. So you're going to expand the office, then. and and we're in the process of doing so. So um, we felt, I mean, we know we've outgrown that office. There's no doubt about it. The bakers wanted to avoid excessive conduit on their walls, so they buried electrical tubing in the floors before pouring the concrete to keep the walls as free as possible of conduit. I don't see a lot of electrical conduit for all the outlets you have here, and you have a lot of outlets. Yeah, we wanted to make sure that we were able to, I mean, no matter where you're at, you could be within a short distance of a drop cord, if you will, or plugging into an outlet and make it easy on everybody. So that does keep the walls clean then, doesn't it? Well, that was the biggest thing. I wanted to be able to clean the walls easily, and I felt that the conduit was gonna be, you know, always an obstruction. And I just didn't like the look of it. Mark recently installed keypad locks and wireless cameras after a break-in inspired him to be more proactive with shop security. So I'm looking up in the corner, I see a camera up there. Uh, you put in the security system? Yeah, we did. Um, you know, we, we recognize that we have a lot of equipment and with customers, uh, uh, planners in, in the buildings and, and a lot of their equipment is in our safekeeping, if you will. And we felt that it was something that we really needed to do not only the camera but uh, locking the shop up and you know we all grew up with the year that we thought you know nothing was ever going to happen but uh, you know it could and, and, and keeping things safe locked up and, and protecting our customers equipment and our own for that matter so we uh, we definitely uh, I, it's not a, I thought it was going to be an inconvenience but it's really not that big of a deal and we went with a touchpad type lock system the age of the shop, I'm not surprised you have T5 lights up here. That's almost become standard in shops recently because is it such great light? Having that extra lighting is really a key and I think it pays, you know. Um, so invest in the lighting when you're putting a building absolutely. like this. Don't absolutely. be chintzy there. Though. Yeah, because really when you think about it, that's one thing you're only going to get one chance at, you know, when you install it and your, your wiring and everything. So do it right. You know, we need to come back to the Baker shop after they finish their future office expansion. I'm sure that office complex will be loaded with a myriad of unique features just like their shop. I'll see you again next time on another Top Shop Tour. Hi, I'm Ray Bohax, the successful farming engine man. And I'm here in the farm shop today to talk about something that's not in the shop, but actually outside your diesel fuel storage tank. You know, we give a lot of thought to servicing the fuel system on a diesel engine, on a piece of equipment, but we tend to forget that that fuel in that storage tank gets exposed to a lot of things that are undesirable. What I have in front of me here are two fuel filters, and I'm using these for representation. They're actually from our farmhouse, the home heating unit, which uses diesel fuel, number two oil. The filter on the left was exposed to about 3,000 gallons of diesel fuel and has no sludge buildup at all, is nice and clean. Here's a new one to compare it to. Other than discoloration, this filter looks like brand new. 
And the key to that happening, because normally they would look terrible. On a diesel fuel tank, you'll have a spin-on filter. I'm using this for demonstration purposes because it's easier to see, you can't see inside a spin-on filter. But the key to understanding this is that that fuel in the storage tank is going to be exposed to temperature extremes. It's going to wicken moisture. It's going to shrink. It's going to expand. And all of that causes a sludge buildup. To take care of that and eliminate it is very simple. There are many excellent diesel fuel storage tank sludge remover products. All you need to do is treat that fuel with a sludge remover when it goes into your tank, when it's delivered to the farm, and treat it at the source so you're not pumping sludge and dirty fuel into your farm equipment. That saves you on maintenance, repairs, and also on filter changes. If you're pumping clean fuel from your farm tank into your farm equipment, then your engine filters last longer, your injectors stay, stay clean, everything is happy. If I could ever help you with any questions you have with your farm equipment, please feel free to contact me at sfengineman at agriculture.com. And for more of my farm shop tips, please visit agriculture.com slash engine man. And don't forget about that storage tank. See you next time in the farm shop. Dealers, lots, and auction grounds are loaded with large, late model, and low hour tractors, offering you a great opportunity to get modern horsepower at a bargain. After these messages, I head to an auction to see what John Deere 8 335Rs are selling for. Not that very long ago, if you were attending an auction such as this sale being conducted by Ritchie Brothers and were bidding on a large late model and low hour tractor, you would suffer some serious sticker shock. Manufacturers couldn't keep up with the demand for new tractors and large late model used tractors were sparse. What about today? We're neck deep in large late model and low hour tractors. These John Deere 8335Rs provide a great example of this trend. Here we have three 2013 models. This one behind me has just 192 hours and is very well equipped with Deere's IVT seamless shifting transmission and its ILS active suspension on the front axle. The next two tractors have tallied up 950 and 1,070 hours separately. This pair is identically equipped with the 16-speed transmissions, four hydraulic outlets, duals all around, and GS3 command center electronics. Now, just prior to the sale, I checked in on John Deere's dealer listing website, machinefinder.com, to check out used inventories. This was a very popular Deere tractor. There are 310 such models sitting on dealers' lots today. So dealers are very well stocked in these machines. How will that influence the final bid of today's tractors? Well, for answers, I'm gonna go talk to Ritchie Brothers iron expert, Rick Vaca, before the sale starts. Rick, you can't find a more cherry tractor on the market today. This has got 192 hours on it, it's a 2014. And I mean, is there a bell and whistle they didn't order on this tractor when they got it new? I don't think this one, this one's got it all. So how do you put a value on this? This is a large, late model, low hour tractor. We've got a lot of these on the marketplace. Yeah, again, it's, it's also they're starting to become a little bit more scarce just because of the 8Rs compared to last year. A lot less new being sold, so therefore, if there's a lot less new being sold, a lot less trade-ins, a lot less trade-ins mean we see fewer and fewer in the auction market, actually. You and I talk at other times of the year. I've got you in Successful Farming Magazine, and you mentioned last December this winter was going to be time to launder a lot of these tractors out. You're telling me the industry has done that. Yeah, and we actually seen values in these come up uh, in the first quarter of this year and the first part of Q2 of this year as well. Okay. The value of an 8R tractor has come up some. Uh, again, not a tremendous amount, but it has come up some compared to last year at this time. Now, we're also going to watch uh, two other similar tractors, similar hours uh, sell today just for a comparison. But they're kind of the basic tractor. How does a guy go in here and say, I'm going to put a final bid on this, and man, it's got ILS, it's got IVT. Where do you get that information to say, okay, it's worth another 5000 10000 20000 to me? 
Well, it, again, it's all what is valued to you, right? So if you need IVT or ILS, you know, the front suspension, and that's something you want in a tractor, you, you know it's going to have an extra value to it. Well, thanks for that information, Rick. I'm going to be very interested to see this tractor sell. So let's watch the 8335R go at auction. Let's try it. 200 pounds on. It is, 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 so, 185,56145 to buy. So, 155 pounds there in Arkansas. So, here are the final bids on these three John Deere 8335Rs. The Cherry Tractor, the three, this one with just 192 hours, the IVT transmission and ILS suspension went for 202,500. The 8335R with 950 hours went for 185,000 and the tractor with over a thousand hours went for 155,000. So how does that compare to recent sales of similar tractors? Let me just talk about the pair of eight 335Rs. Recent sales of similar hour tractors have ranged from 155,000 up to about 181,000. And the full figured eight 335R, those tractors were going from 181,000 up to 225,000. Now, having thrown all those figures at you, I must stress that any sale information that is six months old or older is nearly worthless in today's market. Values on tractors such as these are fluctuating seasonally, even sometimes between months. So if you are looking to purchase a large, late model and low hour tractor, be sure to do your online research and call the auctioneer holding the sale and ask them what values are. Believe me, they are in the business of buying and selling machinery, so they are as well informed as anybody regarding prices. For more information about Ritchie Brothers Auctioneers, you can go to their website at rbauction.com. And you can catch my Steel Deals report in every issue of Successful Farming Magazine. I'll see you next week on another Steel Deals report. After these brief messages, we feature a durable tool storage pegboard made from metal and then talk to a Michigan collector about his love of John Deere vintage horsepower. So please stay tuned. Hello, I'm Bill Rosner. I'm from Tahlequah, Oklahoma. And uh, this idea is a large pegboard. It's uh, four feet in height, 10 feet in length, and it's made out of a one eighth inch solid aluminum. And it contains uh, 5,740 holes. <laughs> uh, the reason I uh, created this, it took a lot of drilling all the holes, is I was looking for something made out of aluminum. I didn't want it to uh, deteriorate. Uh, I didn't want um, uh, whether it was uh, painted or possibly I uh, had one where the it was starting to chip away. So I thought, well, I'm going to spend a little time here and uh, make it out of aluminum so I wouldn't have to worry about uh, issues down the road. To, to put this thing uh, together, um, I kind of helped a little bit. I found another pegboard and I'd just simply clamp it so I didn't have to mark the holes and I would just simply drill all the holes. Then I'd move the uh, template over, drill some more holes, etc. If someone wanted to build this, uh, the first thing you'd want to do is uh, get yourself a uh, piece of uh, sheet metal. Again, this is aluminum, 4x10, maybe a little bit longer than usual. And then probably what would be very beneficial is to have a template so that you could uh, position that over top of the middle. So I already have maybe one maybe out of wood. And then just a drill bit, and I believe all these are uh, quarter-inch holes. For more information on this idea and other agriculture-related ideas, go to agriculture.com slash TV. Our Aegis Iron Feature Tractor this week is a John Deere HWH owned by Nick Bancroft of St. John, Michigan. So I've got to ask, dear people know what an HWH is. For the rest of the world, what is an HWH? It's a John Deere H that was a high crop 
and a wide front. So this was a, a really kind of a, a vegetable tractor, vineyard, well, vineyard tractor too, right? Yeah, most of these ended up in California, oh. working vegetables and, and other table crops. You're a young man. Uh, what was your fascination with tractors? Because when you go to shows, it's old folks like me, right? Right, right. We had a lot of equipment that uh, was somewhat marginal in the company when I started, and uh, we had some John Deere's around and a John Deere mechanic that helped me uh, learn a lot of things and how to work on them. You're talking about uh, the original tractor that you used in the business. What's the business? Uh, Agroliquid. We sell fertilizer across the United States. But the cool thing about this corporate headquarters is it has antique tractors as part of a unique display in the front of the, of the building. It does. Uh, the IQ Hub uh, serves education for kids. We put about 10,000 kids through it last wow. year. Yeah, and it has some old tractor history to teach people where we've been and where we're going. If people are interested in that, where would where could they go to get more information about AgroLiquid and the IQ Hub? You go to agroliquid.com, you can find information on both. Nick, this was a rare version of the H, but the H wasn't necessarily a rare tractor. We saw a lot of usage of them by farmers, didn't we? Yeah, the H was a very inexpensive one plow tractor, kind of designed to replace the horse on the farm. Yeah. Dimension wise, how did this get designated a wide high crop? Well, it has a taller tire on the rear uh, to get it up higher. Uh, the wide front has long spindles on it also to set it up higher. It sets, it sets a fair amount higher than a regular age. And the wide front was just, it was adjusted out wide. Yep, so you could get down more rows uh, yeah. and make more changes in the width. Well, thank you, Nick. I think we'd like to come back sometime and see more of these tractors in your collection. I'll see you again next week on another Aegis Iron Feature Tractor of the Week. Please join us next week for more successful farming. Our Advanced Technologies Editor, Lori Bedord, offers an in-depth report on the spread of broadband technology in rural Nebraska. I spend a day at auction to see what Bobcat skid steer loaders are worth these days. We feature a great farmer invention, and I visit a man that not only loves rare co-op tractors, but is a leading historian on this unusual brand of horsepower. See you next week right here on Successful Farming. Hi, I'm Dave Mowitz. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, hit subscribe right here if you haven't already, and click that little bell right here to be notified when we post a new video. And click here to see more great episodes from Successful Farming Television.